Welcome to Talking Tuesday. I am your host, Fancy Quant, and today we're going to talk about quantitative finance career goals for me, Fancy Quant. Um, a subscriber asked, so a big thank you to that, you know, help spark this video. There have been other videos asking about what is the career progression on a quant, trying to understand that as well. Um, I'm going to dive in here and just talk about my personal goals, my personal layout, what's going on with that. I'm also gonna talk about my other personal goals that kind of relate to the career, but not from a traditional quant perspective, uh, and just shed some light on the amount of effort and work and grind that really takes to be successful, or at least to complete the goals that I've kind of been shooting for. So let's just dive on in here to the structure. Um, titles almost mean nothing. Every single bank has different titles. Um, some banks will start you as analysts, some will start you as associates. Uh, a lot of people in traditional finance like to think of it as analyst, associate, and then like the vice president roles, like, I don't know, assistant vice president, which is AVP, vice president, senior vice president, and then you'd have like associate director, director, uh, senior vice president, senior director, whatever. There's all these weird titles. MD gets thrown in. Um, but they just don't mean a lot because every single bank I've been at has a completely different structure. And then when I talk to past colleagues that are looking at my my resume, my hires, they congratulate you, but they wanna know, like Dimitri, where are you at career-wise? Like, where are you sitting? What would this be at our bank? So a lot of people ask that because yes, every bank has weird title structures. Uh, one of the biggest issues with this is that Quants typically get paid more than business units, and a lot of the reason for this is because of the amount of education. So you come in with a undergrad degree in finance or accounting or business or marketing or English or something, right? You can start and it doesn't really matter. Um, for a quant though, there's a minimum of a master's in something quantitative. So it has to be like statistics, mathematics, you know, econometrics, financial engineering, financial mathematics, all that. And so because of that, you have to pay them more to get them to come there. It's fairly competitive. And so a lot of times the titles are wonky. Um, some banks though will keep the analysts, associate, you know, all that structure. And the way they do that is they just tack on quantitative in the beginning. So then HR can actually pay them more because they're in a quantitative analyst band and not a traditional financial analyst band. HR makes this all messy, which is the entire reason the titles are all screwed up every bank because everyone has a different opinion. Um, I'm not a fan of the titles. I don't think they really matter. But career-wise, you're gonna go through a few different phases just like everyone else, you're gonna start off doing actual hands-on nitty gritty work. Uh, typically you'll get low end projects. So you don't know a lot, you have a manager that kind of guides you and directs you um, or a team lead and they're gonna tell you what to do for the most part. A lot of times they'll give you an assignment and they just throw you in and let you figure it out. So yes, you need to be qualified, hit the ground running. There's really no training for the most part. Uh, at least I've never seen it in a lot of the jobs I've been in but you just have to hit the ground running and you're doing smaller projects, okay? They're nothing big, they're no large profile things, but it's stuff that has to get done. So small model development, small model validation, uh, it's gotta happen, right? And then you work your way up and you become more or less like a senior, I don't wanna call it an analyst, but like a senior associate. So in that range, you're still doing hands-on work, but now you're doing like the big shot project. So you have projects coming in, I don't know, it's a, a $20 billion, $100 billion, a $1 trillion dollar portfolio. So yes, a lot of these mortgage portfolios at banks are trillions of dollars uh, and you're responsible for building that model. Um, <laughs> so the better people get put on these projects, as you progress through the career, you get paid more. So of course you wanna progress and work your way up. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about the progressions here in a second. But after you do that, then a lot of times you transition into like a, they call it like a low level manager, mid level manager. I don't know, everyone calls it different things. But then it's more like what I like to consider like a team lead. So now you're running the projects, you're assigning the work, you're laying out the analytics plan, and then you have people that work essentially underneath of you that are going to help you do more of the heavy lifting in the analytics side. So you kind of graduate up a little bit to management. Um, so. I wanna get this out before we even get rolling with this too much. To do this, you have to be a quant. You cannot have an MBA. You cannot be a business person that eat, I don't know, sleeps and breathes finance and business, and you know the business unit really well. You're gonna make a terrible quant manager because you have no clue what we're doing. Um, and I say this because the best bosses I've ever had are those that have been you know, the developers. They've been in the mid-level. They've worked their way through the same progression. They understand the math. And so when I provide analytics and charts and tables, they look at me and they can say like, Dimitri, this is crap. Like you didn't do this right and I know it's wrong, right? And I'm looking at like the table looks fine and they have so much experience though, they can look at it and say, no, 
this calculation shouldn't be like this. These shouldn't be ranking this way or, you know, they can look at it and tell. Um, I've done it enough now that I'm pretty good at this as well. But you become in a position where you understand that from a mid-level manager and then senior management. So usually like, I don't know, directors, senior directors, MDs, heads of departments, uh, chief model risk officers, CROs, stuff like that. Again, I think they should only have quant backgrounds. You should not be from the business side to do this. Because again, right, you get numbers, you make decisions off these numbers, you have no idea if they're done correctly. If you haven't done the hands-on work, it's gonna be really hard for you to make a judgment if it was done correctly or not. And everyone's gonna say you can depend on everyone below you. You can't, that's a lazy excuse out to say that everyone below you should do their job fine and somehow you should just be sitting on some ivory tower with no like conceptual understanding of the detail and the depths behind this. So yeah, you need a quant background all the way through the process. And luckily, a lot of firms I've been at, we have had quants that have gone through the entire process. So they've been, you know, the hands-on guys, they've been mid-level managers, they've been senior managers, and they've been like executives. So you need that whole line of people. I've been in meetings, conference calls, executive rooms, talking to senior management before, or even executives, and they're just clueless because they don't have the background. So this though is really the career path, right? You work your way through the chain, you build connections. And so I'll talk about the skills here a little bit. Um, every year you need to be focusing on developing you. Uh, that's, that, that does not mean just your quant skills. So from my perspective and opinion here, right? It's just my opinion. Um, I feel like I am like the Mike Tyson of the quant world, right? I'm the heavy hitter, I'm the knockout guy. There's really not a lot of other people that I see that can do what I can do. Uh, and the reason I say this from a quant perspective is being able to cover a variety of different fields um, is challenging. So I've worked across operational risk, I've worked across credit risk and PPNR, and I've had connections and dabblings across market risk because it ties into other areas. And it's pretty easy for me to pick up a lot of these just because of some of my skills I've acquired over the years. But being a quant doesn't mean you memorize things. It doesn't mean you're an expert in one thing. Uh, for me, being a really good quant is being able to pick up any technical problem and being able to solve it. So anyways, so the important piece that I wanna kind of lay out here is that being quantitative and being technical and being good at the hands-on analytical part is only going to take you so far. So even in that analytical hands-on realm, right, even though you're doing the hands-on work and even though you have like the analyst title, to get to that associate or senior associate role, uh, you have to be good with people, you have to work well with others, you have to be able to explain your ideas, write them out. So we do a lot of documentation and writing. Uh, soft career building skills are crucial. Even in the beginning phases of a career, if you wanna be the guy that has your name on that biggest project of the year, uh, they're not gonna select you just because you're a really good analyst. If you're a pain to deal with or you don't do good documentation or you can't work well with other people, a lot of times it's gonna nix your, like, your opportunities, you're gonna have nothing, so it's gonna suck. Um, so again, you need to build a lot of different skills, which leads me to what's like my title now. So I'm what I would consider like a team lead. Uh, so our senior director assigns projects out. Uh, I get a project and then I say, hey, I need resources. They say, how many resources do you need? So how many people do you need? And you'd say, you know, one or two or three or whatever. And I need, I don't know, a data engineer on this project. And then I also need a couple quants and you lay things out and they give you what you need and then you execute the project. For me, for my goals recently and for this year and the last few years here, I've really been pushing and focusing on the soft skills part. Uh, I've built a lot of relationships with the businesses themselves. Some of them are good relationships. Some of them have been rocky and not fun and not enjoyable and they dislike me and I dislike them and that's completely okay. But building relationships and good relationships is crucial because it will help you kind of like move your career forward. Um, when they think that you did a good job on their projects, so I validate other developers, when the developers or the model users like it, word gets back to their people, you know, that this Dimitri or whoever did the project uh, did a lot better job and I really liked working with him. And that takes it a long way when promotion season comes around. Um, the other goal I've been working at a lot is when you're a team lead is I want to get the most out of my people and I want my people that are on my projects um, to really take it to the next level. So. A lot of times team leads or even senior management gets frustrated at projects behind schedule, we're not getting it done. And then people, resources, resources, right? People, people end up getting moved around and pulled from projects and things happen. 
that doesn't look good on you as the team lead. It doesn't look good on the entire team. It doesn't look good on the people on the bottom doing the work as well. So one of the goals I've been working on is trying to figure out how do I optimally work with my resources? So when I have someone assigned to a project, I wanna mentally stop before I get going and think, what are they good at? What are they best at? And I wanna give that to them to make sure they excel. But I'm also trying to figure out like, what are the little add-ons I can give them to kind of make them stretch and expand? And so when mid-year comes around and even like promotional time right into the year, your reviews come around, I want to be able to, and I do, I talk to our senior director and I say, you know, this person didn't do so last year on these things. And I put them on these projects. I did this, this, and that, and they did amazing, right? They did a really good job. They carried the weight, right? I want them to look good. I want their reviews to be well um, received. And I want them to get promoted, right? Because I look like a bad manager or a team lead if my people aren't doing well. And I don't want to lie about it either and say, oh, they're doing great and wonderful because then it makes me look bad saying, hey, you thought you did great, but we think you did pretty bad, right? So for me, I've been working a lot on how do you assign those projects out more uniformly across different people and how do I get more out of those individuals and how do I make the team and that individual specifically look better for our senior director and for company-wide as well? because everybody interacts with us and we'll get feedback on that, like I mentioned. Um, so the first goal there is really just working with others and better optimizing my resources. Um, the second goal, again, is just getting promoted, right? That's just kind of like the grind. You want to keep moving up the ladder. Um, I'm an associate director now. I would love to be a director. So the way our team works, we have one senior director, no directors, two associate directors, and a senior associate. And then we end up pulling from our small team, we pull from other parts of our bigger team. So we need resources and people from other areas. So you'll pull them all in as well. Um, it would be nice to get bumped to that director title, but that's going to be a massive goal. So like two years would be, I think the shortest possible path to that. Um, this is my first year, 2020 has just been a nightmare in general. Um, with COVID, I've had a bunch of personal issues that have kind of taken me out of the game work-wise for a little bit. Um, anyways, it's just been a slow, crappy year. There's been a lot of stuff going on internally, externally. It's just been a nightmare. Um, this is just like a, this is just a building year, that grinding year here, right? It's the worst year. We're going to see how you did in that worst year. Uh, those are my real work goals. Uh, quantitatively though. So again, coming back to the technical side, I'm a team lead. So I could say, screw it. I'm done. I don't want to do the analytical work. Um, but that's not who I am, right? I wanna be able to cover any and every job possible. I really just love being a quant. So I'm working through a few different books right now. Um, I don't have them on me. I'm doing a book review, so a little spoiler alert. I think it'll be a spoiler, this should come out first. Um, I'm working through a stochastic calculus book um, as a personal goal. I work with time series, time series are stochastic processes. Um, I don't like the textbooks that are currently being used in most financial engineering programs. And so I'm actually looking to find a better book. Um, I'm reviewing a book, an author sent one to me to look at and to read. Um, I'm really excited to read it. I'm hoping it's gonna be an all-star, five-star book. Uh, deep down though, I don't think it's gonna be five stars. I'm really hoping it'll be four stars to be a realistic, kind of an, not an optimist, but a realist here. Um, but to do that and to give it a fair shake and really dive in on it, it's gonna take me a lot of time of reading and researching and taking notes and working through problems and looking at other texts I have and trying to put the full picture together from a learning perspective. So I want to learn it even better than what I already did in grad school. So yes, I have the masters, I've taken the stochastic calculus classes. I can say, oh, I've taken it, I know everything, but that's pretty foolish, that's on my list. Um, I have a few other books as well. I'm working through a lot of, <laughs> a lot of books. Uh, I have data science books I'm looking at, I'm working through, trying to get more book reviews done for the channel. But again, this really comes down to my personal learning and trying to improve myself. Um, there's a time series book by Hamilton, which is really, really thick and dense. It's a ton of math. Uh, it takes a look at time series in a very mathematical kind of dry way. Um, I don't think it's the best for learning, but again, I've spent so much time in time series itself. I'm trying to well round out my picture and my academics and trying to really focus on that. So that's another goal here on the technical side. Again, working on that management side and the skills for the promotion, working on the technical side, that's all within my, I guess, kind of work goals. Uh, things that are outside of my work goals that are kind of related. Um, I've been wanting to do 
a few things for the channel, but I'm struggling to figure out how to piece things together with a lot of this. So one of these is I would like to do giveaways. So something I've been kind of playing with, I'd love to do giveaways, but then you start getting into legal issues with how do you set up the contest? You have to have fair rules. It has regulations. You fall under like state gambling laws, for, for instance. Um, you can't just give stuff away apparently. So I would like to do some giveaways. That's like kind of on my goals and things to do for the year, but it's kind of falling apart. Um, and then also I have my half marathon I'm still training for. So again, a physical goal that I'm pushing for and working towards, right? Doing something challenging, something that takes dedication, um, to build some character here, that's gonna be challenging. And then also I'm trying to write a book. And when I say I'm trying to write a book, <laughs> I have two ideas and I've started one. Um, I hope I can finish it within a few years. So I don't, I don't know. It's, it's, it's hard. It's hard to get enough time to do the YouTube channel, which is like a full-time job. It's hard to do your full-time job, which is what you're actually getting paid good money to do. And then it's hard to then all of a sudden try to write books and do other stuff on the side. Um, I would like to write a book though for a variety of reasons. I just don't think there are a lot of really good books on career development and advising. And I think there's a lot of fluff in... I guess politically correct jargon going around. And what ends up happening is you end up with hundreds of resumes that are nonsensical, so it's frustrating from the hiring side. Uh, and then from the other side, right, when you're applying for the jobs, you think you're an amazing fit, you're applying, you're not getting feedback. I wanna write a book on it. Uh, I'm trying to figure out the scope though, if it would only be focused more towards quantitative finance at a very narrow scope, or if I should broaden it to like finance and corporate business, which is more realistic for me or if I should try to expand it into having essentially anything and everyone. Um, I don't know, it's been a challenge. I've written some stuff on it. It's been a doozy. Um, another project and goal I've been working on is creating a short film. So yes, I film and I make YouTube videos. But they're not short films. They're not like a movie with emotions. And for me, I struggle to communicate to a lot of you guys um, the reality of how I see things, what I feel and how I interact and work with the world. I think if more people could like sit inside of my head for like a day or two or even like a week and going through work, you would see a lot of just crazy things and realize how things are structured a lot more dynamically on the technical side, uh, on the politics side within these businesses and banks and on the career side as the whole industry moves and kind of works together. Uh, because I interact with so many random people, students, professionals, right, executives, a variety of different people. And so when you interact with these people, you see things differently. I would like to make a short film. I won't talk about the topics because I've had a few kind of going in the back of my mind. I bought some equipment for it. I've shot some footage. I'm not real happy with it. Um, I don't know. We'll see where that goes. All right. And those are my short term goals. So that's what I'm working on like this year, right? Books, YouTube. I've written some other stuff in general, posted some posts. I don't know. I've done quite a bit of stuff running a half marathon. I have my work goals my technical learning, self-learning goals, book reviews and all that. It's been a crazy busy year for me in general, but then let's step back from this at a long-term perspective. Where do I see myself? Um, I talk a lot about wanting to be an executive. Um, one of the reasons for wanting to be an executive does not have to do with the money or the title because it doesn't really mean anything, right? I mean, imagine you say, okay, I wanna be a chief risk officer. Let's just say a CEO, right? You wanna be the head of the entire business, the company or whatever. So you get up there and you're the CEO of a bank and you get paid a lot of money. Like, then what? Like, <laughs> what, what do you get from that? Right? You get a title and you get paid a lot. Right? That, that's pretty unfulfilling though in itself. Um, the reason I want to be an executive is I want to change the way the banking system functions. I want to change the way the entire bank that I work at and I run operates. And I want to be one of the experts in the industry that's viewed as someone who's like making things happen, changing things for the good. I want the other banks and the other executives to look at me and go, wow, we need to follow suit and do that. Um, I have not seen really a lot of executives do this. I think Lloyd Blankfein, who I look up to somewhat, uh, is one of the best banking CEOs of all times. I just don't see a lot of people like him. Everybody kind of follows the flow. They don't really shake, like rock the boat, right? They just want to like appease everybody and that's fine. And that's what a lot of HR and, you know, all the people involved with the, um, I guess the publicist and all that, they want you to look good and happy and clean and, you know, don't rock the boat and don't be controversial. But I want to change the banks from the inside out. Um, I've already been doing this quite a bit from the bottom. So you can't just say like, when I become this, then I'm going to make changes. 
you got to kind of shake the, the rock the boat here, right? Like I like to say, you got to make people uncomfortable and you got to force people to do what's right as you move up through the ranks, but not push too hard, right? You got to just have the right amount. Um, I've made some good changes. I'm even seeing on some very, very, very small levels uh, that my subscribers are going out and getting jobs and then they're messaging me and complaining that like things aren't done right. And then I follow up with them later and they end up educating more people they work with. So like the knowledge, doing things correctly, being very, very rigorous and academic while also working with the businesses, uh, distilling all that down and having that impact the industry and really showing how quantitative finance can work, but also showing that we need to educate people more internally even after a master's and PhD is crucial. This is one of my biggest goals, like lifetime, long-term, you know, you could say five year, but it's more like, I don't know, 20 year goal, 25 year goal. Um, but I want to get in those positions and I want people to be happy that are all working throughout the bank, but I want everybody to do what they're best at. I think it's a big detriment to banks in general that a lot of banks do things on longevity or friendships and politics get in the way and people that aren't qualified end up being in positions they shouldn't be in. But long term, that's what I'm shooting for. Um, again, right, my main goal is not necessarily just to be an executive, it's to really change the industry. So if I could change the industry and I could be, I don't know, a CEO of an investing firm, or if I could just be the head of research, quantitative research at a firm, it doesn't really matter as long as I can really get that impact that I'm looking for in the industry and help improve and change things. Um, again, something else I didn't mention here is my short-term goals. A lot of times I try to speak at as many events as possible. So I wanna speak at universities, I wanna speak at companies, I wanna speak at conferences, I wanna get in front of people, I wanna show people there are different things you can do to make you know, the industry better, make education better, to fix your modeling, to save money, right? And to top it all off, right, you can make quants extremely happy in their jobs. You can have higher retention, you can reward them, you can promote them, you can build more or less like a very dynamic, exciting, happy, and productive community in the quant world. I don't see this though currently. I see a lot of companies grinding people out. I see a lot of companies where people are just lazy and don't really like the job. So in general, my long-term goal is really to change the industry from the inside out because I just want to see things better, right? That's my end goal. So anyways, those are just my goals. Here's what I've kind of been thinking about lately. Again, I write stuff down at the beginning of the year and like I do it with my manager for work and I write things down personally. But my personal goals like videos, books, research, all that, it blows up within like weeks because you put stuff down and things just go everywhere. Um, right, life events happen, things that you thought were possible are no longer possible, all kinds of stuff happens. Uh, but being flexible, which is one of the key takeaways I can give you guys, be flexible in your goals, have very strict goals for like the shorter term, right? But if something happens, something blows up, you can deviate a little bit. When you set your long-term goals, I think it's better to set something that's a very characteristic core. So something that's like you want to make the industry better, right? Mine's through education and training. Um, if you have other specific goals, kind of set it but don't set it in stone so much that you can't like find multiple paths to get there, right? You're gonna deviate, right? I might work in the banking industry for a while. I've considered leaving banking, going into tech. I've considered leaving banking, going into the investing and trading side, right? I don't really know exactly the path that will get me the maximum impact on increasing education for quants um, internationally, but getting to that point and pushing for that is a real big challenge for me and that's my goal. So for you guys, if you're gonna set goals, really think deep down what would make you happy um, what do you really want to be doing? I think that's a crucial piece. And then figuring out where you're at and how do you get there. So trying to see my short-term and long-term goals here, perhaps it sheds a little bit of light on there. I don't know. But that's just how I do it. So anyways, thanks for listening. And as always, until next time. <laughs>